Welcome to Columbia. My name is Kristen and I am excited to worship with you today. It is so powerful when the people of God gather together to worship. And today, Dr. Jim will continue our sermon series entitled, Holding On. But before we do that, if you are new to Columbia, would you let us know who you are? You can fill out a Connect card at columbiabaptist.org connect, or you can scan the QR code in the corner. When you do, $25 will be donated to our Spend Yourself Hunger Ministry in your honor. Also, why don't you share this service with someone you know? You can hit the share button on Facebook or YouTube and post it so your friends can check out your church. Now, Columbia, let's worship our God with all that we have. Well, good morning, Columbia. It's good to see you. People are coming back in person, and that is an encouragement as we continue to try to find a new normal. So this morning, I am extremely excited to have Grant Goddard with us. He has been leading worship for Columbia for so many years on Saturday evening, and he's agreed to join me on the platform here at 1115 as we continue to exalt the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's stand together. It's very appropriate. The first act of worship we do is to bless the name of the Lord. So let's sing together. Blessed be your name.
people said. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Let's continue to hear from the word of the Lord, Psalm 34. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned.
please continue to worship with the giving of our morning tithes and offerings. We are moving into a time of worship through giving. This is for people who call Columbia home and want to give to what they see God is doing in our church. If you are a guest, please feel no pressure to give. Columbians, you know you can always give through columbiabaptist.org slash give. Today we are outside at the construction site of our new worship center where we're gonna focus on our calling to build this new structure. This is an especially exciting time because we have finally reached the stage in which the foundation is being laid. We serve a God who can move mountains into the seas, but he has called us to join him in building this worship center where many can be reached for him. This is an opportunity for us to have a part in contributing to Columbia's legacy in God's kingdom. Speaking of Columbia's legacy, we are part of a long line of Columbians who have stepped out in faith and have contributed to the church's ability to, out, to reach out to its community and share the gospel locally and throughout the world. Of interest today, um, a week or so ago, a piece of foundation was found as they started building the foundations and pouring them for the new worship center. The piece of foundation that was found came from this old stone building that had originally been built in 1909, and then it was replaced by the Hogue Chapel in 1969. And this old stone building was the building where I had Sunday school during my childhood. These buildings, the old stone building, the chapel that's here in our new worship center, they all represent decades of Colombians who have come together for worship and discipleship. Here is a picture of the old stone building. We want you to focus on the people in the foreground, not the building itself. These were faithful Colombians who posed for a picture after church one Sunday in April, 1948. This photograph represents to us all Colombians from past, present day, and future who have and will contribute to the legacy of Colombia. We don't have pictures from every generation of Colombians who have built on the mission of Columbia, but when we look at this picture, we see all of them. There is a verse that makes this picture really come alive to us. It is in Ezra chapter three, and it starts in verse 11. Let's see if you can envision these people and join them in worship and praise. I'm going to read from this verse from the New International Version and from Ezra three, like I mentioned, in verse 11, and it says, with praise and thanksgiving, they sang to God. He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Can you see these faithful Colombians praising God? Now it is our turn to join God in building a new front door for Columbia. The message translation of this verse in Ezra says, all the people boomed out hurrahs, praising God as the foundation of the temple of God was laid. As we move through each stage of construction, will you join us as we contribute to this part of Columbia's legacy and boom out our own hurrahs in praise and thanksgiving?
Hey, Columbia, it's so great uh, to uh, have many of you out there, but especially to see those of you in here. Every week I see a couple more people who find their way into the room. And, you know, I know it's inconvenient to come right now. Nobody likes to wear a mask. you got to register. I understand that, but it's worth it. It's so worth it. The author of Hebrews uh, talks about worship in this way. He says, you know, let us not give up gathering together as some are wont to do. And when he says that, he says some are in the habit of not gathering. And I always find that insightful, that the habit is not to gather. The discipline is to gather. So you all in the room, so good to see you. I can't tell you the difference it makes for me preaching and teaching to have you there. I'm so grateful you're here. And to you out there, I want to encourage you to come back in, uh, especially if you're vaccinated. Come on, folks. You'll never be safer than you are right now. You're, you're more likely to die of a cold if you're vaccinated. If You've got a good vaccine right now. So if you keep making your way back in, We'll find our way back into the discipline of worship. And for those of you here, I just want you to applaud yourselves for finding your way back in. So come on now. Glad you're here. And Grand Goddard is such a gift to us, and he's going to be a real gift to this service. You were here the first Sunday that Grand was a leader in this worship experience, and that's great. I'm talking about holding on, and there are a lot of things we have to hold on to. Worship is one of them. Any of the disciplines of faith are things we cling to. Holding on, the scripture I used on the first Sunday to introduce this, though, is about holding on to the faith. And we hold on to faith by believing. That's what I've come to understand, what I've come to learn, that belief is activated faith. And so I want to take us down the road a little further. We're halfway through the next step in this series today. But before I do, let me show you a couple of other steps that I love to take. Uh, so, you know, I sometimes will say that I am going to the beach or I've been to the beach. And, you know, people just say they're going to the beach. Now, when they say that, they have a particular place in mind. Okay, so when I say going to the beach, when I say that, you just envisioned somewhere, didn't you? And I've learned that around here, that tends to be the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Not for me. When I say I'm going to the beach, I'm going to Sunset Beach, North Carolina, the southernmost barrier island of North Carolina, just before you enter South Carolina. You go almost till you can't stay in North Carolina anymore. Hang a left in Brunswick County and you're at, you're at what I call the beach. This is heaven on earth as far as I'm concerned. A place my family has had a modest home for decades. I grew up going there, love going there now. And for me, these are the steps that take me to tranquility. Just look at that picture. Come on. I mean, what's not to love? I just was there after Easter. Uh, we went the week after Easter because I'm telling you, I just felt so exhausted and candidly, as a pastor, a little beaten down when we got out of town. I told one of our elders recently trying to describe this, I said to them, if you like disappointing people, this is a magnificent time to be a preacher because it's hard to make anyone happy. It really is. On either side, it's hard to keep people in the middle together. It's just one of those days. I've never known anything like it in my 35 years of pastoring. So I can get to this place, and because I've been there so many times, I'm immediately in the mode. And by the mode, I mean my blood pressure has dropped. I'm sleeping a little more. I just feel calm and relaxed. I do remember you, but it's vague. It's, I barely remember you when I get to this place. Now, the, the thing is, Sunset Beach is an interesting place because the way it was developed, the houses are way back off the beach. Some people don't like this. They, they want to be right there in the surf, but you've got to go over two layers of dunes to get to it on a long walkway. It's going to take some walking to get out there, and it's so worth it. For years, the whole place, the only way you could get to Sunset Beach was by a pontoon bridge. I don't know if you've ever seen a pontoon bridge. This is a World War II era pontoon bridge that floated on the water and you could only go one way at a time so you always would have to wait either for who's coming or <coughs> to your turn to go across and if it was on the hour <coughs> when the bridge was opened so that the boats could get through and and the you know the large boats and the small ones <coughs> pardon me if that happened then you were going to be waiting for a long time with kids in the back of the car screaming, the car's hot, you know, you just left the beach, you haven't been moving enough for the air to be working, it's hot in there, you'd wait, and it was always worth it. And now with a big bridge, easier to get to, it's even more worth it, because this is what you get to right here. Just take a, take a look at that. Just miles of 
undeveloped beachfront <coughs> towards what's called Bird Island. You get down to the end, you take a right, you go to a, a place called Kindred Spirits, which is uh, a place where there's a little mailbox. Have you ever been there? Raise your hand if you've been there. I'm just curious. Okay. Kindred Spirits is a place where people take out the little journals that are inside and they write the most intimate personal stuff, usually anonymously, you know, about what they're struggling with, who they love, things like that. It's fun to read. Once in a while to write in. So you get out there, and the reason it's called Sunset Beach is because it faces in, in a different direction than most beaches in North Carolina. It's sideways, so at the right time of year in the summer, the sun actually sets over the edge of the surf, just like it does on the West Coast. It's just so, so beautiful. So anyway, if I go to the beach, where I hope to go again soon, if I go to the beach and I go there and I all day I look out over the intercoastal waterway and we make our way down to the surf, if I do that, at some point in that two weeks, I might, or a week or whatever it is, I might take a little day trip. And if you take a day trip in Brunswick County, North Carolina, you might go to Southport. Southport's a kind of a cool little town. It's a historic little town. It, it is a port, a working port. But now the big working port is in Wilmington, to the north, on the Cape Fear River, which flows north of there, past Fayetteville, just, just a big, massive waterway that takes goods into North Carolina. And so this is the entry point from the Atlantic Ocean into the Cape Fear River. So you can see in Southport, for example, the old historic Pilots Association, where the harbor pilots would board the ships to help it make its way, help them make their way into the Cape Fear River. Because you see, this is one of the most jagged edges of seacoast in the world, the edge of North Carolina. There are more shipwrecks off about 50 to 60 miles of North Carolina than just about any place on earth. A lot of people don't know that. So it was really hard to navigate, especially before GPS and the like. And what helped you navigate was lighthouses. So you're in Seaport, you're standing on the edge, you're looking out into the Cape Fear River, right into the harbor that joins it to the Atlantic, and you can see two historic lighthouses from that one spot. So in one direction, you'll see the newer, because it's been rebuilt, Oak Island Light. It's really kind of a, it's a working light to this day, it's a, it's a big beacon for the area, you can see it for miles around if you look in one direction, you'll see that. If you look off to your left and straight ahead, what you'll see is Old Baldy. And Old Baldy is located on Bald Head Island. Bald Head Island can only be gotten to by a ferry. Once you get there, you can't use a car. You have to have a golf cart or walk or whatever you do. There's not much there. Just a few houses, few people, whatever. And these two lighthouses in their day, both historic, they marked the two sides of the channel the two sides of the harbor that led from the Atlantic into the Cape Fear River. They were vital. If you didn't have any other way to navigate, to come in right in the middle, right between those two lights, was absolutely your key to survival. It was unsafe to move to one side or the other. The channel was narrow, and you had to make your way in. Now, I, I point this out because I say to you that I think belief is like this. Belief is like fixing your eyes on the light of Jesus Christ and not taking them off, to divert to the right or to the left in any direction. And to this point, I have talked about the benefits that accrue to someone who believes, who activates their faith in belief. But today, I want to start talking to you a little bit about the dangers of misbelieving. So the author of Hebrews says it this way, in Hebrews 12, 2, he talks about running a race, and he says, when we do this, we fix our eyes on Jesus. We fix them, we glue them to Jesus because he is the pioneer and perfecter, the author and the finisher of our faith. We do that not only to accrue benefit, not only because there are tremendous benefits to belief, the ones you've already heard about, the peace and the joy that is indescribable, that comes from believing, actively practicing your faith, or having your prayers guided and answered. That's a benefit of believing, and it's no small benefit. All the benefits that we've talked about are huge, but we, we need to recognize there is a danger, a danger to not believing. The Bible's really clear about this. When Jesus uses the word belief, 
He talks often about the danger of not practicing it, of not believing. Now, the first one's obvious, okay? So the first one is the ultimate danger. It's the eternal danger that we could be separated from God forever. And that danger, everything else pales by comparison. So we could just preach a whole sermon on that, and maybe I should. Because it's quite clear that Jesus said those who do not believe will not enter the kingdom of heaven, will not walk to a new heaven and a new earth, will not experience the resurrection of the dead. It's very clear that this is what Jesus said. I love John 3.16, positive you do too. You can see it all over the place. Any sports event, right? I mean, it's the most quoted verse on planet earth. It was the heart of every Billy Graham sermon for those of you who were around in those days. So we all love John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, pistuo, believes in him, practices their faith in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. What's intriguing to me is I very seldom hear the verses that follow it. I never see them listed, but they nuance 316. They tell us about the danger of not believing. So the first thing we have to see is John 317, one of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible. For me, more important than John 316. I know that sounds strange, but for me. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So the purpose of Jesus appearing was not to judge us. It was not to condemn us. It was not to make us feel bad or guilty or ashamed or whatever the case may be. The purpose of Jesus coming was for our salvation. However, however, John 3.18 is equally important. And this is what it says. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. It's not that Jesus condemns us, it's that we have already condemned ourselves and we've not accepted the rescue that Jesus brings in his death and resurrection, the benefit. We've not received it. And there is an eternal danger in not receiving it. Verse 21, John begins to conclude his thought here. Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, like fixing our eyes on a lighthouse and nothing else and walking straight for it, so that it may be seen plainly that they have done, has been done in the sight of God. Now, this is where I'm eventually going to go. I'm going to meander back around to this. So, Jesus was the light, and everything Jesus did could be seen plainly in the light of day. He did not withdraw to the desert with his followers and build some sort of a tabernacle. He did not design a cult, if you will. And neither did he call people to be at war with others. He asked people to accept others even if they were different than themselves. And everything Jesus did was out in the open in plain sight of everyone. Jesus called his followers Not to leave society and not to fight society, but to stand boldly as lighthouses with him as the beacon in the midst of society. Let me show you how serious he was about that. But before I do, let's remember what we're studying. So if you're new with us today, I'll give you just enough to catch up. I was reading the Bible in its original languages this past fall, that's Greek. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I decided to read the Gospels. I hadn't done this in a while. I'm just like you. My heart language is English. That's what I grew up speaking. When I dream, I dream in English. I don't think I've ever dreamed in Greek, let me just say. As much as I've studied it, I don't remember ever dreaming in Greek. So when I read the Bible, I prefer to read it in my native tongue. I prefer to read the NIV or NASB or the KJV or the ESV or some other translation or collections of them. But there is nothing like anything's original language. This is the heart language of the Bible, or at least of the New Testament. So if you really want to get the literal meaning, sometimes you do need to go back to the original verbiage. I'm going to show you in a few moments why that matters. One little word can change everything sometimes in the way that we translate. 
So I'm reading through the Gospels and I see the word pistuo. Seen it a million times. Don't know how many times I've translated the word pistuo. Whenever you see pistuo, you say believing or believe, whatever fits the sentence, belief sometimes. So pistuo, however, is a verb that means to believe or to entrust. What I noticed that I hadn't noticed before is that in the Gospels, and then I discovered in the rest of the New Testament, this word is never used ever, ever, ever to speak about anything but believing in, activating faith in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, belief in God. So you don't believe ideas in the New Testament. You don't believe in people in the New Testament. You don't believe anything in the New Testament except God. It's impossible to believe in the New Testament in anything else. Now that really was, it chastised me a bit. Why? Because I talk about believing stuff all the time. Don't you? I I believe it's going to rain today. Really? You believe that? You mean, I guess it's going to rain today. That's what you mean. That's awfully weak, isn't it? For a word the Bible reserves only for God. Or, or, or we'll say to somebody, I believe in you. Do you really? Is that what you mean to say? Or do you mean to say, I have confidence in you, and it is my belief in God that teaches me why I should have confidence in you? Do you understand the difference? It's not small. So I started wondering about the way we use the word belief. And I started thinking, I wonder if in a a wrong discipleship in the church of Jesus Christ, we have wound things into the rope of belief that cause our people to be more susceptible, not less, to others and other causes who ask them to believe in them. My supposition became... That if we do not believe in God alone, we are liable to believe in anyone or anything who comes along and stokes our fear. I think I'm on target here. You can disagree with me if you like, but give it some thought. Why is it that Christians like me seem more susceptible today to far out nonsense, conspiracy, doomsday, doomsday scenarios, misinformation of all sorts, Why is that? Shouldn't we be the people who are most immune to somebody's opinion? Most immune to untruth. Doesn't mean we don't regard it. I didn't give up my common sense the day I decided to follow Jesus. Did you? It doesn't mean we don't regard it, but it does mean we are not susceptible to people and causes that ask us to believe in them because we believe only in God. Now, what made this more powerful is when I looked at that word again and went, wait a second, pistuo, of course. This is the verb form of pistis. Pistis is a word you may know. Pistis means faith. So, really, the word pistuo means faithing. If that were an English word, we would use it, but it's not. So, I suggest we make it one. But anyway, that's a different thing. What happens to you is you're reading in English, you see belief, you see faith, you don't see the connection between the two. You kind of assume, in fact, I guess, that they're both the same thing. But faith is given by God through the Holy Spirit. It is not of ourselves, Paul said, lest anyone should boast. We can't create faith. Belief is activating that faith, acting on that faith. When we become believers, we are actively practicing faith in God and God alone. Now, when I get to this story, I think you're going to understand it better. So, just in case you haven't figured this out yet, every one of these sermons, except the very last one, and you'll figure out why when we get there, except the ninth one, every one of these sermons is based on a story of Jesus and the way he spoke about faith. This is week five. In the previous four weeks, we covered seven stories, seven incidences of Jesus teaching about faith. Today, we're going to cover one more, and this one's a little more obscure, a little more difficult to understand, so you're really going to have to hang with me to make sure you understand where I'm headed, and then you'll have to decide whether you agree with me or not, of course, because, you know, just so you know, okay, whatever I suggest to you, preachers are like everybody else. We have opinions. That's that's the deal. You know, every human being, opinions are like belly buttons and other parts of the anatomy. Everybody's got one. Now, Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 28, is a fascinating conversation. It's more fascinating than I used to think it was. Recently, 
as I was reading, I started to recognize all that was going on in this conversation that I'd missed before. You know, like I was seeing it on its surface, which is how I usually hear it spoken of and quoted, and I suddenly realized all that was happening in the dynamics, maybe not all, but a lot of what was happening in the dynamics between Jesus and his apostles. Now, you know, Jesus, I'm sure, made small talk. I'm positive he did, you know. I'm sure that Jesus said, hey, guys, what's for dinner? I'm relatively certain that Jesus said, hey, dudes, how you doing? Probably not exactly like that, but in in Aramaic. But that small talk is not recorded in the Gospels. It's only very intentional to place the very intentional words of Jesus on the page. So when we see these words, we have to look at them carefully because there's no throwaway in the words that are in the gospel. These are very compact accounts of what Jesus said and did. This particular one, Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 28, and a little beyond, is a conversation between Jesus and his apostles about the end of days, the last times, Jesus' second coming. But there's more going on here than just that. Let me show you how this starts, and immediately you'll see what I mean. So this is Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 3. Jesus left the temple, and he was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. This is funny. Everybody knew about the temple. If you were in Jerusalem in that day and time, it was the most predominant structure in the city It's still right in the middle. You can't miss even the ruin of it today. But everyone knew the temple. So so just picture this, okay? Jesus is walking with his apostles, and they pass the temple, and they go, Hey, Jesus, there's the temple. And Jesus, I'm positive, in his mind thought just for a second, Duh, been there many times, and you know all the stuff that's happened to me in the courtyards of those temples, guys. I know that place. It'd be, it'd be like you walking with me down Columbia Street and you saying to me, Hey, Jim, there's the church. I would look at you like you had three heads. I'd go, well, of course. It is. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know that. So anyway, they say, there's the temple. Take a look at those structures. Take a look at those buildings. Do you see all those things? Jesus asks, listen to the economy of words. Do you see all those things? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. And indeed, those words came true just a couple of decades, a little more than a couple of decades after Jesus' death. So that's true. And resurrection. That that happened. Now, what is he talking about here? Before we have all the rest of what's in here, what is Jesus talking about? He's talking about two things. First of all, he's talking about the destruction of the temple. That's clear. It's plain that he is saying these buildings will be destroyed. But secondly, he is talking about the destruction of a faith system. The sacrificial system that is rooted in the temple. And he is saying to his apostles, that's all going away. It is not going to be here. Everything you hold sacred will fall. And so the sum total of this is that he's saying to the apostles, don't believe in that. Don't exercise your faith in that. Because like all flesh, it's going away. It would be similar to your walking down the street with me and you're saying to me, hey, Jim, there's the church. And I turning to you and say, no, no, that is not the church. That is the building. And someday every stone in that building will not stand one upon the other. Now, listen, this pains me to say this. I love looking at the stone church. It's not there anymore. Someday this room you're sitting in won't be here. I don't know when, but if Jesus tarries, it will not be. And someday this new building that we're spending so much money on effort on, it will be gone too. Because all things flesh fail. They all go away. This is not the church. This is our place. It's kind of like the beach, right? When I say I'm going to church, I have a place in mind. But there's more beach than my beach. And there's more church than my church. 
In fact, the church, as God's people in Jesus' name on earth, active in society, is so much larger than what we associate our faith with. And so he's saying to the apostles, listen, guys, I know you grew up believing in that place. Don't do it. Be careful. Now, what is Jesus not talking about here? Anything else? (laughs) So listen to the question that the apostles ask. And ask yourself, are they listening to him? As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, that's afterwards, the disciples came to him privately, which is what we do when we're afraid we might be embarrassed by what we ask. And they say to him, tell us, when will this happen? the destruction of the temple. Now listen to the next part of the sentence. And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? I never noticed this before. They changed the subject. But the reason they changed the subject is because to them these events were one and the same. They could not imagine a world that could go on without the temple standing. They could not imagine a world that would exist without the system they had worshipped standing. They could not imagine that the things they believed in would be gone. I think this is important because we are the same way. There are two types of people that speak to me about the end of time. Older people who know the end of their life might be near often speak to me about the end of time. Why? Because they cannot imagine a world without them in it. That's human nature. The second group of people are people who have lived through the last year. In the last year, I've had more people ask me about end times than all of the previous 34 years of ministry combined. Why? Because when we are fearful about the future, we start to think about end things. When we are fearful about the future... We start to calculate and to guess and to reason and to think we're believing. When we are afraid about the future, we tend to go off the edge. And that's what's happening in our culture today. So it's hard for anybody to imagine the world still being here if their nation is not here. So a lot of people will say to me, well, you know, America falls and then it's the end of the world. Probably not. Jesus is going to, look, people keep telling me Jesus is going to come soon. I need to tell you, they've been saying that for over 2,000 years in the church. Now, here's the good news. Eventually, somebody's going to be right. Because even a blind hog finds an acorn every now and then. Even a stopped clock tells time correctly twice a day. Eventually, somebody's going to say that, and then it's going to happen right after, and I'm going to go, man. I wish I'd known I would have placed a bet. But what difference would that make? Because I'm not going to be here anymore. Now think about this. People are afraid, and so they start to think about this. The disciples are afraid. They're thinking about this. They ask Jesus about the last times. But they, they conflate their belief in the temple and the system with their belief in God. And Jesus is going to say to them, no can do. It's kind of interesting. Jesus rarely tells the disciples they're foolish. A couple of occasions he comes close. But usually he takes their brainless questions and he just gently responds to them. I'm so grateful for that because he tends to respond gratefully to me, gently with me too, right? When I ask silly questions and worry about silly things. So Jesus could have stopped right here and said, listen guys, I just told you Don't put your belief in that. What about that did you not understand? Why are you guys so dumb? But instead, he humors them by giving them some vague information, and it is incredibly vague, about what the last days will look like. So if you want to read that scripture, you can go read it, because I'm going to skip over it here. And He says a few things, and then he concludes that with this. This is how he concludes it. Matthew 24, verses 22 through 28. Jesus said, this is the end of his thoughts on the last days. Now, if those days had been cut, not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. 
Now, so that I don't cheat you on the end times, because I know some of you, that's what you want to talk about, you know. I mean, go read Daniel and Revelation. Good luck. Good luck with that. And turn to each other right now and say, it's going to happen fast. Just say it. Tell somebody around you it's going to happen fast. The days will be short. Don't worry. Some people tell me we, we are surviving the last times. No, no, no. No, it's going to be way worse than this. But it's going to happen so fast, you're not going to have to worry about it. At that time, if anyone says to you, now Jesus is going to get to what he really wants to talk about now. This is like his conversation about the temple. If at that time, anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, in the English, do not believe it. Now, here's where it's interesting. I'm reading the Greek, not the English, when I'm looking at this the first time. There's no it. There's no pronoun it in the Greek. There is a pronoun it in the Greek. It's not in the Greek text in Matthew. In other words, it is inserted by those who are translating into English based on their assumption about how this should be understood. What you need to understand, and I hate to tell you this because every time I say this, somebody gets upset about it. But I'm telling you, there is no such thing as translation without interpretation. Whenever you're translating from one language to another, you're always interpreting. You know this if you speak another language. Those of you who speak Spanish, for example, probably more of those than anything else, you know that when you're translating from one language to another, you have to make a, a best guess at what the author is trying to say. If you're talking to somebody, you ask for further explanation so you can get it. From Greek to English, this is really true in a number of cases, and it's really true here if you ask me. And this seems small, and if it's small to you, that's fine. Just tune me out for a couple minutes and come back. But it's important to me. I don't think Jesus said, do not believe it. Let me give you a good example of how this happens. I've been translated into I don't know how many languages. I've preached in I don't know how many places over the years. I mean a lot. So almost every continent, not every, but almost every continent. And and when you get translated, it's really interesting. So the first question you want to ask, if if you ever get to do this, I'm just telling you. Maybe some of you have done this not preaching, but in other contests. You want to, can I meet my translator? Because you need to know what you're dealing with. Nine out of ten times in churches, they will give you a student who knows English pretty well. And if they do, you're in trouble. And the reason is because that student will very woodenly translate what you're saying into the native language and you never know what's going to come out. So I've had this happen to me in India, whether I was speaking Hindi or uh, one of the native uh, tongues that is spoken there, so many languages spoken there. I was speaking in China, translated into Chinese. Uh, the, the place, though, it was funniest of all, uh, you know, South America, all over the place, um, uh, Portuguese and, and, and Spanish and whatever. The funniest time that it ever affected me, though, I was in Russia on your behalf. I was in Moscow at Moscow Central Church. I'm preaching to a packed house. It's winter time. And it is cold as everything outside. And it is hot as Hades in that room. The Russians heat like nobody's business. They love saunas. I don't know why they bother. Every room I'm in feels like one. And they wear their winter coats and don't take them off and worship. They're bundled right up next to each other. so hot in this room. And you're supposed to preach in here. And I'm preaching and I have a student. And the student is translating me. And I decide, you know, I'm going to make it simple today for this person. I'm going to preach a really simple sermon. And the sermon I'm going to preach is dog and cat theology. Have you guys ever heard of dog and cat theology? Great little book. But it was a story before that. And it goes something like this. I'll tell you quickly how it goes. It's funny. So, you know, a dog says... You feed me, you water me, you love me, put a roof over my head, etc. You must be God. And a cat says, you feed me, you water me, you love me, you put a roof over my head. I must be God. And, of course, we want to be dogs and not cats. Now, listen, I'm sorry. Don't email me, cat people. Do not. You know as well as I do cats are like this. You just happen to appreciate it. I don't know why you do, but you do. I'm a dog guy. I'm a dog guy because I like loyal dogs. So... Anyway, this student is literally translating this. Now, you need to know if you've never been there in Russia, even in Moscow. 
In Russia, dogs and cats just roam the streets. They're vagrants. I mean, they're just, ugh, they're dirty, whatever. I knew this, but it didn't compute in my pea-sized little brain. It would never occurred to me it might be problematic to speak about pets in that culture. Dumb. But I did it. I get up there, and so I tell them, and my translators wouldn't be translated. And when I say this, she says to the, to the congregation, you are dogs, <laughs> and you are cats. Now, in my case, the former wouldn't offend me at all, but the latter, ha, ha, ha. The whole thing offended them. They're getting madder and madder out there, and I can see it. Now, look, I'm used to seeing people get mad when I preach, but usually you know you're going to make them mad. In this case, I was confused completely. I mean, I'm not talking about anything controversial here. They're getting madder and madder. Debbie was there. She can tell you. They got madder and madder. And after the service, they just, they're, they're angry. And so I go to the pastor, Sergei Zoltoreski, who speaks just a little English. He says he's like a dog. He says, much understanding, little speaking. So I'm talking to him, and I'm saying, what happened? And he said, you called him dogs? You called him? And I go, no, I didn't call him dogs. It was, it was a metaphor. It, it was an example. And he said, well, in Russia, you just don't do that. I had to go before the church on Wednesday night and apologize. But really, she should have apologized as my translator. And afterwards, the president of the local seminary came to me laughing. He thought it was hilarious. I did not find it humorous. He thought it was hilarious, and he comes to me and said, I don't know why they didn't have me do that for you. I would have translated it in such a way that we would have, they would have understood what you're saying. So the first thing you want if you're going to preach in a foreign culture is a translator who is a preacher because they will preach a better sermon than you did in their culture. Now what happens is when you translate, you always interpret. So this it in this sentence makes a huge difference. Now let's, let's read it carefully so you'll see what I'm saying. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe. It's very different than saying do not believe it. It is about the piece of information. Believe is about the character and the cause. That sentence ends like this. Me pistuista, which means don't believe. See how similar it is to the temple thing that Jesus started with? If people ask you to believe in them, now listen to what Jesus is saying. If anyone on planet earth should ask you to believe in them except for me, don't believe they are false prophets and false messiahs. Now the problem is people are asking me to believe in them all the time these days. They're asking for fealty, loyalty, absolute belief. And the safeguard for us as followers of Jesus is we will not do that for anyone except for Jesus. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus is the only one who walked the face of the earth. He's the only one in whom we'll believe. It's smart for us. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That's the only thing I'll put my faith in. I will not believe in a character or a cause. This has really changed the way I've thought about some things. Now, think about how often we say we believe in something. And I mean really mean it. I believe in this political platform. I believe in this candidate. I believe in this leader. I believe in whatever it is you believe in. I believe in socialism. I believe in capitalism. No, we don't believe in any of those things. That's the stuff we try to ferret out with the brains God gave us. We don't believe those things. They cannot render eternal meaning and they cannot render salvation. We don't believe in those things. Our belief helps us understand how we will measure those things. This is huge to me. Maybe it's not to you. And I think it was to Jesus. So he's saying to his apostles, when these false characters and causes come, do not believe. Don't use belief. It's the wrong thing. He continues, you see, false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders 
to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Now, Jesus seems to be saying here that those of us who are believers should be immune to, should be immune to misinformation, untruth, people who ask us to believe. What scares me is today, it seems to me that my brand of believers in Jesus are more likely, not less, to believe pure baloney, and to base life and death decisions on that baloney. What's happened? Why are we so immune? Why are we not immune? And the answer, the best answer I can come up with is wrong discipleship in the church, that we have discipled people to believe, and we've jumbled into that bucket of belief or into that rope of belief. We've bundled in a lot of other stuff, political, societal, All sorts of stuff get bundled in there. And once you bundle it, it's hard to unbundle. I think that's what tends to happen. So Jesus says, see, even the elect, they'll try to deceive. I have told you ahead of time. I warned you. Don't say I didn't tell you, guys. See, I've told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is out in the wilderness do not go. Or, here he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. Now, here's the other thing I missed. There's a possibility this one is a little too creative. Just warning you. Possibility, because I, I, I've never seen it anywhere else, but it suddenly occurred to me, nothing Jesus said was anything but intentional. So everything Jesus said is very intentional. So what do these words mean? Why didn't Jesus say, look, if, if the Messiah says, do what he, don't do it? Why did he say, if he says, go out there in the wilderness, don't go? And if he says, come in here in the inner, inner room, don't believe it? I think it is because false prophets and false prophecies usually are of two ilk. They are of two types. Give this some thought and see if you think I'm right. The first type is escapist. Escape. And the second kind is entrenchment. Entrenchment. Now, give this some thought. People who ask us to believe in them should throw up red flags because they ask us to do thing, two, one of two things. The first kind of false prophet and false prophecy is about escapism. Think here, for example, about Jonestown in Guyana. Think about a false prophet with a false prophecy who asked people to leave their societies and their lives in a way Jesus never did and to go off to a place in order to escape public scrutiny so that what they did could be done in private. He called it building a new kingdom. If that's what a new kingdom looks like, we're in trouble because it ended when all of them drank arsenic-laced Kool-Aid and died, or cyanide, whatever it was. Still to this day, we talk about drinking the Kool-Aid. That's it. They should have known because nobody who even remotely uses the name of Jesus would ever ask you to join a cult by leaving your sphere of influence and going out somewhere where nobody can watch. Jesus never did that, and the church at its best does not do that. We should be out in plain view, out in the open, where everybody can see us. That's demonstrated integrity. That's who we are. Jesus called his people out in order to call them back into society so that they could change that society with his love, his grace, and his mercy. That's what Jesus did, and that's what he still does. The problem is some churches follow this route. They're escapist. They just want to get away from the world. No, we want to be a lighthouse in the world, the beacon on top of which is Jesus Christ and Him alone, the only one in whom we will believe. Understood? The second thing, though, is entrenchment. Building walls against others that usually are walls of hate and not walls of love, if there is such a thing as a wall of love. So think here about Hitler. I hate to pick out that example because it's so simple, but this is what he did. 
With radical nationalism, he inspired a culture to hate Jewish people just because they were different and just because they'd been successful. That's it. They should have known the German Christians, but only the confessing church, a tiny little group in that country did. They should have known. The church was more susceptible, not less, in Germany because they bundled nationalism into their belief. And so Hitler just carried them along, and they became haters of other people, and a program became possible to kill as many of them as possible. But he's not the only one. If you want to think about American history, how about McCarthy? And his route on communism. Granted, some people may have deserved some scrutiny, but not all the people he included in the bunch. He was using that campaign for his own personal power and well-being. Historically, we don't even remotely disagree about that. This is entrenchment. When any leader asks you to despise others, to push others away, to hate others, whatever the case may be, when they do that, you know you are listening to a false prophet with a false prophecy. A great leader will always call you back into your sphere of influence to make a difference. Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus said, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. And that's what we're looking for from people who would be our leaders. Now, what's interesting about this is when I say escape and entrench, I'm following the order here of the Scripture. But I could say entrench and escape. And then we could say that we're talking about fight and flight. And those are the two human responses to fear. So people use fear, our fear... To manipulate us and they ask us for our fealty our loyalty don't question anything I'm saying and they ask us to believe in them and we will not do that I'll follow you if what you're doing is just and righteous but at the end of the day if I come to the point where I see somebody asking me to do something that is absolutely wrong and absolutely unjust I will not do it, it makes sense doesn't it fight or flight fear Entrenchment, escape. Can you think of any people we should be worried about? Well, I don't like to name names in this day and time. I will tell you this. It is harder to identify false prophets and false prophecies in prospect than it is in retrospect. Sometimes it's hard to figure out what's going on. And sometimes we have to confess that we get swept up in the emotion of it, right? We get swept up in the movement of it. So what is the safeguard? The safeguard is to believe in no one except for Jesus Christ, even if they're singing your song, even if you agree with them. I mean even your husband or your wife, your son or your daughter, your father or your mother, your next door neighbor, your best friend. I mean even your president, your senator, your mayor. I mean even your preacher. Don't believe in me ever, ever. I'm not worthy of it but believe in the one that I worship. Believe in the one I seek to point you to. Together, that's what binds us together. In the church of Jesus Christ, what binds us together is this common belief in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even though we may disagree on any number of things. That's what holds us together, or at least that's what used to. You know, back in the day. Hmm. This might be a great scripture for our time. So if they're saying, go out there, escape, don't do it. If they're saying, come in here to the halls of power, into the inner rooms, and build a fortress, don't believe. Do not, Jesus said, believe. Now then Jesus says to them this, to conclude the thought. Remember, they changed the subject from the temple to the end time. So Jesus said, listen, guys, not only is it going to happen quickly, as I just told you a minute ago, but as lightning comes from the east and is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And I think he went, huh? And they went, oh, what do you mean? She said, all right, look, look, listen. Wherever there is a carcass, there the vultures will gather. 
Now, what does this mean? I get asked about the latter part of this often. The force part should be really easy to see, okay? When a thunderstorm is coming, even if it doesn't ever rain at your house, you see the lightning. You know it's there. It comes from way, way off. Then you count the number of seconds before the clap of thunder to see how far away it is, right? Lightning's visible all summer long. When there's a lightning strike, it can be seen everywhere. Jesus was saying to them, guys, listen, when I come back, you will know it. It won't be coded. It won't be mysterious. It won't be hard to figure out. I'll let you know it's me. It's good news, isn't it? Right? They didn't quite get it yet. And so he says, listen, you can't hide a dead body in the street. The vulture circle. People see. Don't you see when I come? Don't worry about this, guys. God has got it. Take care of it. Jesus is saying, believe only in God. Let him take care of the rest. Hard to do. Because man, do we sometimes seem to want to be God. And to make these decisions for him. It would be easier for him, right? Belief in God is protection against sin and shame. It's like a vaccine. It teaches our immune system to recognize when we're being buffeted by false prophets and false prophecies, by untruths, misinformation, and fear. And that rescues us from sin and shame. Paul says in Ephesians, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, pistuo, or a form of it, you were marked in him with a seal. You were sealed so that only your belief in God would exist. You were sealed from everything else. How did that happen? Through the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance eternal until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. Belief is protective. Believing is protective. Yes, it is dangerous not to believe. It is protective to believe. The first week in the sermon-based notes, I included a quote, one of my favorite quotes about this from C.S. Lewis. I always love C.S. Lewis. Sometimes I agree with him, sometimes I don't, but I love C.S. Lewis. And um, he lost his wife, as many of you know, years ago, of course, while he was alive. And he'd had so little time with her, and he loved her so much, and it shook his belief. And so he wrote a book about it. He wrote a book about his doubts and his struggles when he was in grief. You been there? Been there? And the book is called A Grief Observed. And I think it's my favorite C.S. Lewis book. Most people say mere Christianity. I would say that this are screw tape letters. So C.S. Lewis writes this. He said, you never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death to you. It's easy to say you believe a rope to be strong and sound as long as you are merely using it to cord a box. Most of what we do in life is cording boxes, right? But suppose you had to hang by that rope over a precipice. Let's say the precipice of eternity let's say, the precipice of hell itself. Wouldn't you then first discover how much you really trusted it? People are believing in a lot of things that are going to let them down today. A lot of characters and a lot of causes that have no eternal significance, whatever. And they are putting those faith, their faith in those things, not recognizing that this is a matter of life and death. Ultimately, eternally, this is a matter of life and death. Jesus was saying, everybody else will let you down. 
they'll either fail, they'll blow up, they'll have a moral problem, they'll misuse the money, whatever. Or they'll die and you're going to be left alone. And at the end of the day, the question will be, what have you believed that has eternal significance and value? It is a dangerous thing to believe in anything except for God. It's not just unwise. It's not just risky. It is dangerous to believe in anyone or anything except God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Father, by the Holy Spirit, give us the strength to activate the faith that you have given us in you and to trust you and your Son, Jesus Christ, and the indwelling Holy Spirit, Father, and only you. Because at the end of the day, we do know that everything else will let us down. Even things we believe in a human sense are right and true. None of them is worthy of that word, belief. We believe in you. We trust you completely to take care of it all. And we do this in Jesus' name and for his sake. And Lord, as a church, we will not make the mistakes some churches have and be escapist, trying to get away from it all. We will be called back into this society, this sphere of influence to make an impact with the love and grace of your son Jesus. Nor will we make the mistake of many churches who become nothing but culture warriors who hate everyone around them and consider themselves the only righteous people on planet earth. We will be people called back into this society to bear fruit in Jesus' name. And we will do this because we believe in you, Father, through your Son Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now watch a few announcements before you go. As you prepare to go ignite passion for Jesus Christ from Metro Washington to the world, I have a few things I'd like to share with you. First, we are busy planning for our next All Columbia Baptism service on June 6th. But is God calling you to get baptized at this service? Baptism is a powerful symbol of a believer's recreation in Christ and a way to publicly confess that Jesus is Lord. If you have committed your life to Jesus but have not yet been baptized, are you ready? To sign up, visit columbiabaptist.org slash I am ready. We look forward to rejoicing with you as you complete this next step in your discipleship journey. Lastly, calling all gardeners. Did you know you can use your green thumbs to love your neighbors and serve your community this summer by growing and sharing fresh food at the Spend Yourself Food Pantry? Help struggling families in our community by sharing your harvest. Everyone enjoys fresh produce. Wait, 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 what is this? This is citrus. We've got a pineapple, bananas, a mango. Wait, did someone just bring these from home? You guys, none of this stuff actually grows in Virginia. We grow things like tomatoes, green beans, cucumbers, eggplant, summer squash, any of that would have totally worked. <laughs> Clearly, you guys aren't gardeners. Well, this year, when you all are planting your Virginia-grown, seasonally appropriate veggies and fruits, consider planting an extra row and donating the produce. When your produce is ready to drop off at Columbia's Crossroads campus, you can email us at gardens at columbiabaptist.org. May your gardens be fruitful. Thanks for being with us today. Again, if you are new to Columbia, please go to columbiabaptist.org slash connect and let us know who you are. We would love to get you connected and send you a welcome gift. Now, as whole life disciples, live out the power of the resurrection everywhere you go in everything you do. Have a great day and we'll see you back next week.
I'm not mic'd. Columbia, I love you. I'm praying for you. Those I haven't seen yet, I can't wait to see you. Have a blessed week. You go and ignite passion for Jesus Christ from Metro Washington to the world. See you soon.